Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Now, when I was first told that you guys worshipped in a gym, I did think there'd be a lot of one-on-one. -on -one. And I got to tell you, I'm sure I've got some grandchildren that are really disappointed we're not going to be playing today. But they were kind enough to bring me this prop. Here you go. As you probably already know, Jim said is my name, and Kim and I are very glad to be here. And I will just say that uh, I look forward to getting to know all of you. And the, the Bishop's Committee kind of stole my thunder. We didn't talk to each other about what we were going to do, and I was going to acknowledge them. Um, but I want to acknowledge you as well. But first I want to explain how many people really understand what a vicar in charge is. Because if you do, you need to explain it to me. <laughs> a vicar is one who is um, a clergy person who's in charge of a parish or a, of a mission. And a mission is uh, a church that's still dependent upon the diocese. And we are um, for now. Um, the erector is one who... Uh, the, the church has attained what's called parish status, and then that parish sends money to the diocese. So we are a mission, and the diocese supports us. Um, so it's a little bit different. Um, the in charge part, I don't have a clue. I mean, we've all seen Charles in charge, <laughs> but don't count on any of that from me. Um, I'm a girl dad, so I was never in charge of anything, and you can ask them, they happen to be here right now. I have no authority. I want to compliment you all. There are many churches that did not survive the COVID. There are many churches that closed. We have one right here in our own diocese. Um, St. Stephen's in Elwood is closing. And so I, it's very commendable to you all and to your bishop's committee that you survived this, something that has never happened in our lifetime. Unless you were alive in 1918 during the Spanish influenza, and if you were, I'd like a dietary list of the things you eat. <laughs> but we, we, we haven't experienced that kind of stress. What are we going to do? Um, and if we, you know, you, you switched rapidly into the, the magical medium of technology. So we, we welcome the people that are watching us online. And I, I hope my mom is. She's supposed to be. I sent her the information. Um, but it's your, if someone were to ask me what attracted me here, it's your resiliency. It's your spirit. You know, when you say the Holy Spirit is here, it really is. And that was very um, apparent to me. And you may not know this, but my family and I have been here before. Um, we would come home um, from Augusta for Christmas, and we, this is the church we attended. Um, so we've been here about four other times. In fact, these guys are on your website, a picture. How about that? They're asking me for royalties, but I don't really know if that's appropriate. <laughs> but I will tell you this. Um, the testimonials that were given last week were pretty phenomenal. Has everybody had a chance to listen to those? If you haven't, thank God for technology. You can go back and listen to them. They are phenomenal. They're beautiful. Thank you. Um, someone told me today that, well, he's probably not going to do that for another six years. Um, and I, I'm going to say, well, you, you might have to do it sooner because you did a pretty good job, <laughs> you know? Um, so I, that I commend you on that. Um, and those are the stories that we have to continue to tell. And that's, that's really how the Holy Spirit works in this place, through all of us, lifting all of us up. And you can feel that when you walk in here. And you don't have to have all of the accoutrements that the big churches have to have that. We know the Holy Spirit works in this place and she does some of her best work here. So I'm going I'm to tell you a story. And, um, you know, the Commission on Ministry, well, actually, one of the questions that the Bishop's Committee asked me that I thought was pretty good, um, then they asked me a lot of questions, so this is just one, 
was, um, why did I want to become a priest? Well, I didn't. <laughs> and, and so um, the, the Commission on Ministry, when they were talking to me, they said, well, why would we ordain a perfectly good layperson? Because we, Kim and I were on, uh, both of us have been on the vestry of St. Francis in the field. We came from St. Francis, the Episcopal Church up in Zionsville. Um, Kim has even been the senior warden. She was one of the first family member in our family uh, that was a female who was a senior warden. I think that gets a round of applause. <laughs> and we were there when um, St. Francis went from a mission um, to become a parish. And we were there when they did their expansion. And, and our girls went to Zionsville High School, and that was the church we, that was the church we attended. But the question I thought was really good, and, and I, I think my answer would be that it's because I wanted to make a difference. I saw that, that things weren't, we were going down a path where we were just looking out for ourselves, you know, and, and, and actually we had a pretty good gig going. <laughs> I, I just, I, I was a, a vice president and, uh, of sales, and she, she worked for St. Vincent's Hospital, and, and, you know, God has a very funny sense of humor. So anyway, um, I felt that I had something to say. But here's the key point, I think. As baptized Episcopalians, as baptized Christians, our ministry doesn't change no matter what happens. And you all proved that during these two years of COVID. Our ministry doesn't change. It, it continues to be the same. We are to profess this radical nature of God's kingdom to everyone, and we are to reconcile them to God. And that's our, that's our role. And we come here each week to be recharged. This is like a charging station. I said it last night. This is, we're all like Teslas, and this is our charging station. And we get refueled here. And, and we get refueled to go back out there. And the... the I love the fact that you worship in a gym. I love that because that takes all the pressure off the building and allows us to, to focus on what's really important. We don't have to worry if the roof goes. That's not our problem. If, if something up here gets knocked down, we don't have to fix that. You know, we don't. So we don't have to concentrate on the physical plant. We can concentrate on the really important things. And, you know, we can live into our baptismal vow. You know, St. Francis said, you know, preach the gospel at all times and sometimes even use words. And that's what we can do. And this, this good Sam's does this wonderful thing. This is what really kind of clinched it for me. Serve all, love all, no exceptions. I mean, that doesn't get any simpler. I mean... I, Sometimes many things have to be explained to me. <laughs> but this, there's no big theology words here. There's no, no exegesis has to take place on your mission statement. We don't have to say, well, what do they really mean? It's pretty clear. Love all, serve all, no exceptions. It's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. So the second story I want to share with you is when, when I went to seminary, I went to Virginia Theological Seminary, and, you know, I'd been worshiping at St. Francis, and, and that, that space helped to form me, and Waycross helped to form me, and, and the, the, my discernment committee helped to form me into, in fact, I started out actually discerning a call to the vocational diaconate, which just is, is a deacon. You keep your day job, and then you, you give 12 hours of service per week to the church, and then during the course of that discernment, it, we discerned that my call really was to the priesthood. And so we went to Virginia Theological Seminary, and um, it was hard for me to get used to worshiping in their Emmanuel Chapel. It was very ornate. It was very old. It was absolutely lovely. It was made of wonderful wood, and in 2010, my class burned it down. Uh, you've heard, you know what smells and bells are, right? They were practicing using incense. Now, I was... I was down in the library studying like a good student should, and I was studying with John George, and he'd gone upstairs, and he calls me, and we were studying for a test, and he says, you better get up here, the chapel's on fire. And I said, quit playing around, get back down here and study. 
you're not going to pass the test. He goes, no, I'm serious. And actually, it, was, it turned out to be a blessing in disguise for the seminary because the whole class couldn't be in the church at the same time. It was really teeny. It was small. It could only seat about 90 people. So with only seating 90 people, there were over 200 kids in the class, and then you had the professor. So we actually had to use the space of the Episcopal High School, which was right next door. But what happened then was they moved uh, our worship space to Scott Hall, which was this great big room right outside the cafeteria. And we learned to worship in a space that typically was not used for a church. And they, they consecrated it. And sometimes during a moment of silence, you could hear the dishes clanging in the, in the refectory, which was right next door. Um, and we got used to worshiping there. And then they built the Lully Pate Memorial Chapel downstairs, which they converted an auditorium into another worship space. And then we got used to that. And then my field education site was Church of the Epiphany in downtown Washington, D.C. And right as we came, they decided they were going to do this great big renovation, and they were all worshiping in their community hall. So this is like coming home for me. I'm not used to worshiping in churches. So the big lesson here, I guess, is, is you know, we, we come here, we learn to worship really anywhere we are, but the key thing is we say the prayers, um, we, we, are, we, have, uh, we break the bread, we have fellowship together, we get recharged, and then we go back out. And it really doesn't matter where that is, um, the building, if you will. What matters is we, as the body of Christ, all of us, this is what matters. When you think back on a church maybe that touched you early in your life, or, or even this one, do you think of the building? No, you really think of the people that, that touched your lives. So the place really doesn't make the faithful, the faithful make the place, right? So there were two guys walking along beside each other, and they were talking, and they were talking about religion and religiosity, and the one guy said, so you're, so you're so rich in religion, I bet you can't say the Apostles' Creed. In fact, I'll, I'll make it easy for you. I'll bet you $10 you can't say the Lord's Prayer. So the guy thought for a minute, and he goes, okay. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. And the, guy, the other guy hands him the $10 and said, I didn't think you could do it. There's an, uh, an Anglican theologian, an English priest, if you will, named Richard Hooker, who he was discussing the authority of the church, and he said that really it's a three-legged stool for us, and that is scripture, tradition, and reason. And that's really one thing I like about the Episcopal Church is we don't ask you to check your brain at the door, and it's okay to disagree. Even sometimes, I mean, the one thing that really unites us all is we believe that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. And, and sometimes people argue about that. Okay, that's all right too. But really, that's the thing we have to agree on. But we don't, we don't have to, you don't have to check your brain at the door when you come in. You're not going to be told what to think or how to worship or what to do. You get to decide. We welcome questions. You know, and a lot of times people will say, well, you Episcopalians, you're not biblical at all. How would you respond to that? You're not Bible-based. Yes, we are. You just heard an Old Testament lesson, you get a New Testament lesson, you get a psalm, you get a, a gospel lesson, and then you get somebody interpreting the gospel. And actually, our prayer book, which is, which is what makes up most of the order of worship, which is in your, in your bulletin, that comes from the Bible. A lot of those prayers come from the Bible. So we are Bible-based. So don't let them tell you we're not Bible-based. So let's talk about, this is a horrible parable for me to have to do on my first Sunday. <laughs> you know, Amy mentioned it in one of her sermons that she couldn't wait for me to come. <laughs> Did you guys hear this parable? I mean, this is about a dishonest estate manager, right? And he intentionally messes up the accounts, and then he gets in trouble for it. 
And his response is to turn around and forgive half of what one debtor owes his master and 20% of what another debtor owes, perceiving that he's doing this for his own benefit, right? And then, here's the clincher, the master praises him for this shrewdness that he's doing. Whoa. It's very, confu it's very confusing, definitely. Ultimately, though, we can view this parable as perhaps an insight to priority setting, setting our priorities. You know, for a while, the manager had his priorities in the wrong order. And what I mean by that is he put his wealth ahead of everybody else's wealth. The moment he changes his priorities and he grants forgiveness, even partial forgiveness of the debts, he's praised by his master. And instead of trying to gain wealth at the expense of others, he focuses instead on personal relationships regardless of the wealth. It's priorities. It's the way what's, you know, they used to say that, you know, uh, show me your checkbook and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you where your priorities are. Um, what are your priorities? It's about how we set our, how we set those and what, are we looking to gain earthly wealth or heavenly wealth? So these two accountants are in a bank and it falls victim to robbers coming in right away and the, the patrons are immediately gathered up and they're all put in a corner and these two accountants, they're right beside each other and the robbers go about their business in the bank and, and they ask everybody to empty their pockets and, and to put everything out there and quickly one of the accountants pulls out something and hands it to the other guy and the other guy goes, what's that? And he goes, that's the $300 I owe you. <laughs> it's all about priorities. And here's, that's the message for today. We have, to, we have to focus on heavenly abundance and not earthly wealth. If our priority is to, give, uh, is to give to the others in order to also receive, if we give to receive, then we've missed the whole point. We've lost all the values that Jesus offers us. If we're always giving, hoping that we get something, if we only do something in return for something, then we've missed the lesson somewhere along the line. The offering of grace, forgiveness of debts, and love come to us from heaven and bring us to heavenly abundance. They are not the wealth of the earth, they are the wealth of God. And that's what we should be in pursuit of. And all the Christian people say, Amen.